War in the air involves every kind of attack and defense. Weapons include guns, rockets, missiles, and bombs. Over the years, the aircraft and the technology have changed, while the basic principles have remained the same. And as always, people are all important. With modern pilots being taken to the edge of their physical endurance by the amazing new capabilities of their mounts. Here in 1943, TBF Avengers depart to attack Japanese targets. F4U Corsair fighters, escorted by Army P-38 Lightnings, go out to hit Japanese positions on Okinawa. Douglas SBD Dauntless dive bombers sank more Japanese ships than any other aircraft. Curtis Hawk fighters were used widely. But a later type shot down this Japanese Ki-46 Dyna fast reconnaissance aircraft. The clock moves on to Korea in 1968 where North American F-100 Super Sabres, designed 17 years earlier, leave their protective revetments on an attack mission with GP bombs. The F-100 was one of the rare aircraft equally good at fighting or attack. Powered by an afterburning J-37 turbojet, it could fly at supersonic speed on the level, though not with bombs. Some were F-100F two-seaters. Internal armament comprised four M-39 revolver cannon of 20 millimeter caliber. Here, a heavy attack is mounted with normal M82 free-fall bombs from medium altitude. For low-level attack, a favored weapon was the Snake Eye retarded bomb, pulled back by its air brakes to allow the aircraft to get clear of the burst. On most missions until 1972, enemy opposition was almost non-existent, making Vietnam an unusual kind of war. Now the scene changes dramatically to the mighty carrier air wings of the U.S. Navy. In 1972, the Grumman F-14A Tomcat set an utterly new level of fighter capability and it is still unequal today. Steam catapults hurl the 30 or more tons of fighter off the bows and would do so even if the twin TF-30 engines were switched off and the parking brake left on. Takeoffs and landings are always made with the swing wings at minimum sweep, giving the maximum span for high lift at low speeds.
for supersonic speeds at up to Mach 2.3, the wings are pivoted right back. Here, an F-14 at the Pacific Missile Test Center at Point Mugu is about to test the new AIM 54C version of the Phoenix. This is the West's biggest air-to-air -air missile, weighing 1,000 pounds and costing $1 million. It's carried only by the F-14, which can fire up to six simultaneously, all against different targets. This takes a team of two, pilot and radar intercept officer. They have to manage an airplane that can detect and track up to 24 targets at ranges up to 195 miles. In favorable conditions, Phoenix missiles can be launched at ranges of well over 100 miles. fly to their targets at Mach 4, finally homing with the aid of the missile's own nose radar. Fourteen crews hone their skills in top gun exercises. Behind the bogey, now you can re-attack from the advantage position, being above the bogey. The F-5 has a primary job of finding, engaging, and tying up the F-14s. The A-4s haul chili. Let's go for it. Here, F-14s take off for just such a workout. Off to go the adversaries, played by A-4 Skyhawks and F-5E Tiger IIs. For the pilots involved, it is the most realistic and tough training that can be devised. But real missiles are not fired. After each exercise, electronic records prove who did what. That's a good kill, Roger. And I went straightened out going for the uh, A4s over there and uh, just never saw you back there as you shot me. Walter called me back, and by then it was too late. The temptation was to try to come up into the fight, but we stayed over here the ship point of the game plan and it worked. This F-14, launching an AIM-7 Sparrow, is on a firing range. Occasionally, an F-14 is able to fly direct from such practice back to his ship. Stretching out wings, gear, and hook, the sleek fighter turns into a gaunt, long-legged bird, searching for the deck, and if possible, the number three wire. While the F-14s are the defenders of the fleet, the Grumman A-6E intruder is its offensive muscle. Built like a tank by what is popularly called the Grumman Ironworks, the A-6 is about the same size and weight as an F-14. But in design, it is totally different. 
pilot and navigator sit side by side so the pilot can watch his partner calmly tapping computerized keys as the preparations go ahead for the brutal cat shot that will fling them off the ship. A6s have been flying 30 years, but have been kept in the front line by continual improvements, especially to the radar and avionics. Some have a target recognition attack multi-sensor, or TRAM turret, under the nose, containing an interlinked laser and infrared sensor to assist target recognition and attack in bad weather or at night. Practice attacks are often made with snake eye bombs. In recent years, some of the attack load has been taken by the McDonnell Douglas F.A. 18 Hornet. Evolved from a Northrop light fighter, the Hornet is powered by two F-404 augmented turbofans and has exceptional all-round performance and versatility. It was designed to replace the F-4 Phantom in the fighter role and the A-7E Corsair II in the attack role. Very few aircraft have ever been designed from the start to fly both missions. Thus, the Hornet pilot can make a precision attack on a surface target and then start shooting down enemy aircraft. The prototype Hornet failed to meet the Navy's requirements for rate of roll. But watch this. One of its many pluses is that it set an entirely new standard in cockpits, replacing nearly all the traditional dial instruments by three big multicolored TV type displays, each of which can be reprogrammed by touching a button to show different kinds of picture or information. Today, Hornets fly not only with the Navy and Marines, but also with several export customers, including Canada, Australia, and Spain. Back in 1965, the Jaguar was designed jointly by Britain and France as a light supersonic attack trainer, but it matured as a very formidable strike and reconnaissance aircraft. This is despite having two tiny afterburning engines and a span of less than 29 feet. Jaguars are seen here in India and over the desert of Oman, one of the customers who appreciated its combination of long range, heavy weapon load, precision delivery, reliability, and low cost of operation. Up to 10,500 pounds of attack missiles, bombs, or rockets can be loaded, and a reconnaissance pod can be attached under the fuselage. Those Jaguars pose us problems. Those boys truly part the sand and shave the rocks. They have a nice airplane, 
They fight aggressively, and their low-level tactics are good. Very good. They've got the hang of terrain masking their Jaguars. We find them hard to acquire visually, and when we do pick them up, they're sure no easy kill. That was an assessment by a U.S. pilot after one of the tough red flag exercises in Nevada. Another of the advantages of Jaguar, which in any real war might make the difference between destruction on an airfield and survival, is that the long, soft-tired landing gear enables these aircraft to operate from grass, sand, or, in this case, a motorway under construction. Sadly, many air forces failed to practice such off-airfield operations. Some Jaguars are two-seaters, and this is the view of a backseater. With small, highly loaded wings, the Jaguar gives a smooth ride even in the dense, rough air at near ground level. Most versions have an inertial navigation system which drives the head-up display and a moving map display, which were innovations a quarter century ago. Some Jaguars have unusual overwing pylons for such air-to-air -air missiles as Sidewinder and Magic, giving a powerful self-defense capability without cutting into the underwing attack load. The great survivability factor we feel is that we've got an aircraft which you can virtually guarantee to make a fast, low-level, accurate single-pass attack. Newest of the world's tactical attack aircraft is AMX, jointly produced by Air Italia of Italy and Embraer of Brazil. About the size, weight and power of a hunter, and with generally similar performance, it is in fact 40 years newer in concept and has all the latest avionics and technology needed to fly today's missions. The engine is an unaugmented Spey turbofan, made under license in the two participating countries. Like Jaguar, the AMX has a small wing for smooth flight at full power at low level, yet fitted with effective slats and flaps for high lift during low speed takeoffs and landings. Carrying external weapons weighing up to 8,377 pounds, the AMX has an excellent attack radius and a modern head-up display for accurate delivery of free-fall bombs or rockets. The Italian version has an internal 20mm M61 multi-barrel gun, while the Brazilians chose two 30mm cannon. Self-defense sidewinder or similar missiles can be fired from rails at the wingtips. Quite small, AMX can tackle anything. It is quite capable of destroying this large ship, for example.
So perhaps could the French Dassault Bruger Mirage 2000. But this is a bird of a different feather. Its whole design was centered on supersonic speeds at up to Mach 2 at high altitude, and for the air combat mission rather than surface attack. Thus, it is an excellent air show performer, combining the power and noise of an afterburning M53 turbojet with the high lift capabilities of a tailless Delta airframe a generation later than that of the familiar Mirage 3. All Mirage 2000s have a wide range of avionics, equipment, and weapon options, including twin 30 mm guns, many kinds of missile and advanced radars, cockpit displays, and electronic countermeasure systems. The chief missiles on the 200C are the Super 530 and Magic. Several versions have a prominent fixed refueling probe. Dassault also made a single example of the Mirage 4000. This is essentially an enlarged Mirage 2000, powered by two of the same kind of engine. It first flew in 1979, and for some years has been assisting the development of the later Rafale. In particular, it has been exploring the behavior of a Delta fitted with canard four planes, especially in turbulent air. NASA hoped that a foreign government, such as Saudi Arabia, might fund the development of a production version. But this large and quite capable aircraft has remained a single prototype, painted in Dassault's house colors of white with red and blue trim. There could be no greater contrast than to arrive at RAF Wittering which from early 1969 was the home of the jet lift Harrier. Here for many years, number 233 OCU taught pilots to fly the Harrier GR1 and then the GR3 as seen here. The GR3 introduced the longer nose, housing a laser ranger and marked target seeker and antennas on the tail for passive radar warning receivers. One of the chief weapons of these early Harriers is the 68 mm Sneb rocket, which can pierce all but the thick frontal armor of a main battle tank. Produced in France, 19 rockets can be rippled or salvoed from each launcher. Harriers almost always make a short rolling takeoff, though with a restricted load, they could lift off vertically. Arriving at the firing range, this GR3 proceeds to rack up a typically good score. Though simple aircraft, the GR3 has a combination of inertial navigation system, laser ranger, and head-up display that enable a skilled pilot to put rockets, freefall bombs, or 30 millimeter shells directly on the target. The Harrier also scores by being an extremely small and elusive target with great agility and a smokeless engine. After each mission at Wittering, the turnaround usually takes only a few minutes. Aircraft serviceability is always close to 100%, and refueling and rearming with experienced ground crews has to proceed in parallel.
Usually the first thing is to replace the perforated aerodynamic front cowl of the Matra 155 rocket pod, while 19 fresh snebs are loaded at the back. With a different pilot, the GR-3 is very soon back in the air, often demonstrating its ability to hover, which in war can mean the difference between death on an airfield and survival in a dispersed location. Here, the Harriers have the luxury of paved taxiways leading to their camouflaged hides. These aircraft bear the markings of number three and four squadrons, based at Gütersloh in Germany. This happens to be nearer the Warsaw Pact forces than any other NATO airbase. So the Harriers are expert at disappearing into camouflaged hides in a way that no other NATO aircraft can emulate. Sister to the GR-3, the Sea Harrier normally operates at sea. It needs no catapults and no arrestor wires, and so could, in theory, operate from a helicopter pad or the top of a merchant ship container. And in the Falklands War, Sea Harriers operated in weather that would have prohibited all flying from any conventional carrier. Seen from below, this Sea Harrier shows its twin 30-millimeter gun pods underwing tanks, and sidewinder missiles. During the Falklands War, 190-gallon tanks were introduced, as well as twin sidewinder launches on the outboard pylons. Moreover, the Royal Navy's two-inch rockets, seeing here being rippled away from a sea harrier, were in the Falklands also carried by RAF Harrier GR-3s. Though smaller than the SNEB, the two-inch, or 50.8 millimeter, has very high velocity, and instead of carrying 19 rockets, the launcher can fire 36. This makes a really impressive salvo, which Royal Navy pilots launch against towed splash targets on the sea surface. In the case of the Sea Harrier, the Sidewinder is used not so much for defense as for offense, because the Sea Harrier operates in the fighter role. In the attack mission, one of the most effective weapons is the BL-755 cluster bomb, weighing 611 pounds and each dispensing 147 deadly bombs. BL-755 is equally effective against armor or infantry. Today, the Harrier GR-3 is fast being replaced by the GR-5 Harrier II, developed jointly by McDonnell Douglas and British Aerospace. In the nose is the Hughes angle rate bombing system, which enables free fall stores to be put down with the precision of dual TV and laser target tracking and ranging. Here again, BL-755 cluster bombs are being carried. But for any given mission, the Harrier II can carry at least double the load of the GR-3. In fact, the maximum weapon load is 9,200 pounds, carried on up to 11 pylons. In this view, the totally new wing could be seen, which makes it all possible. Made almost entirely of carbon fiber, it also houses 50% more fuel than in earlier Harriers. This gives either double the mission radius or double the weapon load. And the new Harriers are also far easier to fly, with an up-to-date cockpit and advanced avionics and flight control.
Coming in to hover or land, the giant flaps are lowered, giving extra lift in partnership with the thrust from the vectored nozzles of the Pegasus engine. Flaps are also set partway down on takeoff. Even with a heavy roll, the Harrier II can get away with a ground roll of two or three fuselage lengths. The biggest operator of Harrier II is the U.S. Marine Corps, which calls it the AV-8B. Taxiing out, this 8B shows off its new bulged high-visibility canopy and retracted flight refueling probe above the inlet duct. More than any other aircraft in the world, this is really survivable air power. It will still be there fighting, even after the enemy has wiped out all our airfields. Here, an 8B lands after a training mission with pylons empty. Of course, in this condition, it does not need any kind of airstrip at all and could make a VL, a vertical landing, such as sometimes practiced and is seen here. The Marines need to make VLs when they go to sea because each man has to put down on his designated deck spot. This is much easier than with the older AV-8A. Takeoffs at sea are fast rolls made with nozzles aft and then quickly vectored down to about 55 degrees as the aircraft comes to the end of the deck. Thanks to the ARBS in the nose, all AV-8Bs can designate targets for paveway laser-guided bombs, making precision attacks with almost 100% effectiveness. The Marines are now getting the night attack Harrier with a forward-looking infrared and many other extras. In the RAF, a rather different new version is the GR-7. The scene now shifts to a NATO base for conventional aircraft which are tied to long runways, and so everything possible must be done to protect them on the ground. The aircraft and alert crews live in hardened shelters which are proof against small conventional bombs, and where sounding the alarm results in things happening very quickly. Running feet, warbling sirens and the sound of TF-30 engines starting up means the 48th Tactical Fighter Wing is springing into action.
Soon, the 50-ton F-111 attack aircraft is outside and heading for the runway. Before it gets there, the Weapons Systems Officer, or WSO, extends the pave tack beneath the aircraft for an end-to-end -end boresight check of its laser and forward-looking infrared sensors, which must be exactly parallel for accurate delivery of the Paveway laser-guided bombs under the wings. PaveTac interfaces with the F-111 avionics and side-by-side -side cockpit for navigation, target acquisition, and weapon aiming. The F-111F, by far the best of this family of swing-wing attack aircraft, can cover almost the entire European battle area from its English bases. Near the target, the PaveTac is extended into the operating position. At first, the terrain monitoring mode provides a night window using the infrared to present the WSO with a clear picture of the terrain in the run-up to the target. As the target comes into view, the pave tack is cued to it to provide accurate steering for the pilot. It's usual to initiate a HUD attack pass using the head-up display for guidance. The WSO tracks the target on the PaveTac video screen for accurate steering, using the laser for accurate ranging to determine the release point of the weapon. At this point, the weapon is released, and the pilot initiates an escape maneuver. The weapon falls free until about 10 to 12 seconds from impact, when it enters an imaginary basket in the sky. Then the WSO resumes laser tracking, illuminating the target so that the weapon homes and scores a direct hit. I never thought that uh, we'd be able to introduce it and get it online and play with it uh, in the short time that we have. It's supportable and it works and it's a tremendous uh, increase in capability for SACUR and our NATO commitment. After the attack, the WSO retracts the pave tack back into the weapon bay. It multiplies the effectiveness of each F-111F. Europe's counterpart of the F-111 is Tornado, which is similar in capability apart from having slightly shorter range, but appreciably smaller and, in most respects, newer in technology. These are RAF Tornado GR-1s. The 
Tornado is a very, very comfortable airplane to fly. It handles very nicely. Weather, it doesn't bounce around as much as some of its predecessors. And it's particularly quiet. The air conditioning is uh, a real brief. It's variable geometry when we talk about tight maneuvering. And part of this is valley flying. We can get down below the valley walls into the bottom of the valley to hide from any defender's radar. And if it's a very tight valley, we can put the wings forward, the maneuver flat down, and make a very, very tight turn, reversing keeping the wings back as we go. 560 knots, we're showing about four early, which is okay. Okay. I've got 11 miles to target. Good yeah, that checks, looks good. One okay. minute, starting the attack sequence. Roger. We've got 540 ground speed, you can put that up a bit. I've got barrel IN. Okay, I've got low loft selected. Okay. Ready for symbology? Target symbology is in. Target slightly left. Okay, stand by. Radar's on. Correcting slightly left as well. Okay, I've got it. It's a good mark. Night speed. All Clocks weapon. away, 55 seconds. Weapon package looks good. Correction coming in short. I'm correcting slightly right. There you go, that's the right hand correction. Got it. 45 seconds. Seven miles. Weapon switch is live. Height and speed are good. It's looking good. Stand by for reheat. Ready. Reheat's coming in. Nozzles again. Phase two. Pulling up. Marks confirmed. Committing the attack. It's looking good. It's looking good. Thousand on the way up. Through 1500. Weapon's gone. Bomb's gone. Throttle's out. Mid setting. Let's get back down to the deck and get the hell out of here and go home. Very similar aircraft are used by the Federal German Luftwaffe, though some of the German weapons and countermeasures pod are different. Another user is Italy's Aeronautica Militare, which again uses some different weapons and equipment. Yet another user is Germany's Marine Flieger, these four customers together fly over 660 tornadoes, not including fighter or export versions. The Luftwaffe and Marine Flieger use the bulky MW1 bomblet dispenser system, which can pump out 4,704 submunitions on a single pass. Another Marine Flieger and Aeronautica Militari weapon is the Cormoran anti-ship guided missile. The RAF uses a quite different version of Tornado, the F-3 long-range all-weather interceptor. Better than any other aircraft in the world, this can stand ready to go at a moment's notice and then scramble to identify an intruding aircraft anywhere from the northern tip of Norway to Iceland, no matter what the weather. Such missions often require flight refueling. What is your line and continue on the last.
The F-3 seldom needs to demonstrate its agility except at air shows, but it has few limitations. After prolonged hiccups, the advanced radar works well, and the crew can do everything they're supposed to do with a 27mm gun and a choice of missiles including the big radar-guided Sparrow, or Skyflash. An active Skyflash is under development, but the American AMRAAM is planned as the future medium-range missile. To ensure a clean separation, the Fraser Nash launchers thrust the missile well away before release. France's contender for the world market in the 1990s is the Dassault Berger Rafale, a word meaning squall or hurricane. A representative of the new breed of basically unstable fighter, kept pointing the way it's going by fast-acting computers, Rafale is a Delta with powered canard foreplanes and two M88 engines to give more than double the thrust of earlier Mirages. With such thrust and a big high lift wing, Rafale could hardly fail to be a spectacular performer at both very high and very low speeds. Here, in a slow fly past, it's possible to see the angle of the canards in this flight condition. higher speeds, the pilot can pull 9G in a turn or roll at some 300 degrees per second. Like the Mirage 2000, but unlike older Mirages, the wing leading edge carries full span slats, giving extra lift at low speeds, as in photographic sorties. It's planned to put two versions into production, Rafale D for the Air Force and Rafale M for the Navy. On the 30th of April, 1987, the sole Rafale prototype made a series of approaches and wave-off overshoots on the carrier Clemenceau without actually hitting the deck to confirm satisfactory handling and pilot view. One trouble is that the existing Crusader fighters must be replaced from 1993, while the Rafale M will not be available until at least 1998. Briefly, Red Flag is an exercise that we operate in the Tactical Air Command for all of the fighter forces of the United States Air Force. We have additional participation from all of the other tactical forces of the Navy and Marines, as well as our allies. Increasingly, we are experiencing participation with the Strategic Air Command and our Military Airlift Command forces in what has become the largest and most complex composite force exercise that's run anywhere in the world today. Red Flag is the biggest and most exciting military air exercise in the world. Aircraft arrive from all over, like this F-111D and this F-16A. The composite force exercises that we run at Red Flag are run in other places in some ways. However, we have the unique opportunity here to run them on the best range, overland range that exists anywhere in the world today. Additionally, this overland range here at the Tactical Fighter Weapons Center 
is highly instrumented and extremely sophisticated in order to be able to provide feedback to the air crews measuring their effectiveness in how they accomplish their missions and how they accomplish their mission objectives. The training that crews experience when they come, come to Red Flag starts with extremely detailed mission planning for large force attacks on interdiction style targets whereby all facets of tactical aviation are practiced. And that involves uh, the offensive counter air roll, airfield attack, suppression of enemy air defenses, electronic warfare, battlefield air interdiction, and defensive counter air for those few forces that get to participate on the red side. Red flag normally operates with approximately 100 aircraft on station here at Nellis for a six week period. Everything about Red Flag is for real. Here, live snake eyes go aboard an F-111. Ordnance consumption is considerable. Like knights in the jousting lists, the crews come out to do battle. Every crew checks ordnance, safety wires and pins to make sure no accidents can happen. F-16s from Hill Air Force Base don't have far to come. F-15s get airborne. An essential part is played by the EF-111A Raven electronic warfare platforms. Visitors can include Mirage F-1s and Jaguars from friendly nations, as well as F-15s, F-4Es, EF-111As, Tornadoes, and A-10s. computerized instrumentation keeps track of the whole airspace. Somewhere in that airspace, F-15s peel off for an interception. Soon an enemy is centered in the HUD site. An A-10 tries to run in among the weeds. Computers record, measure and provide evidence. An F-15 returns. Another F-15 takes off and, for the photographer, makes a near vertical maximum rate climb. Here, four F-15Cs go looking for targets. They come all the way from Bitburg, Germany.
Here they can actually fire missiles, just like the missile and gun test firings carried out by gaily painted F-15 prototypes. F-5E Tiger IIs act the role of hostile aggressors. Often they have to take on the F-15s in close combat, where the big fighter has fewer advantages. Every pilot has to fly to the limits. Only this can hone a pilot's skills to the razor edge that means victory and survival. Sometimes an F-15 makes a mistake and is caught in the gun sight. More often, the sight latches onto an F-5. Joining the fray, F-15s of the home unit, the 57th Fighter Weapons Wing at Nellis. There is simply no substitute for the tough sparring that goes on in the instrumented sky over the Nellis ranges. No simulation can achieve the same results. When you go through a red flag exercise, you feel your enemies really are your enemies, and you surpass yourself trying to beat them. As a result, everyone becomes a master of war in the air. Oh, 